Welcome to the Living Well Church podcast and thanks for tuning in today. Our mission as a church is to help people find faith in Jesus and a life of purpose and hope. You're about to watch a message that will challenge you, inspire you, encourage you, and most of all, point you to Jesus and the life of purpose and hope he has planned for you. So lean in and enjoy, and let God speak into your life. Evening. Good to see you here. We're going to be continuing, as Katie said, talking about uh, the Beatitudes tonight. Um, in Matthew 5, and uh, the two that we're going to be looking at tonight are in verse 6 and 7. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And for me, you know, these two verses actually sum up the whole of the story of the Bible and the whole of God's plan for mankind. They're revealed in these, two, in these two verses. And if we wanted to sum them up in just four words, then I think the words that, that uh, the prophet Micah speaks in, in Micah 6, and it, it's, there's a, a list of things about what, what does God desire and what doesn't he desire. And it sums it up by saying, seek justice and love mercy. And the, uh, the, the word righteousness in, in this passage can equally be uh, translated in as as justice, so righteousness is is being whole, complete, having this right relationship with God, um, and justice speaks in into that as well. Um, the meaning of justice, I suppose, is the is the meeting out of what someone deserves. So if someone is a murderer, um, the meeting out of justice is is the punishment that they receive for that, and mercy is not giving someone what they deserve. And if we as people here in in Whitfield or wherever you're from, um, if we can grasp something of what these two facets, these two things mean, then we will live transformational lives. We have a a vision here to see people come to, to know Jesus, to have faith in Jesus and a life of purpose and hope. And if we really grasp these, the meaning of these two verses, then we'll, we'll really see that coming to pass. But to understand a bit more about justice and mercy, we really need to know a little bit about God <laughs> and about what his character is and something of his holiness. Because, you see, God is holy and he is righteous. He is perfect. He is perfection. There's no fault in him. He's completely just. He's completely pure. He's untarnished. He's complete. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's ever-present. There is no one and no thing which is above him. And because of all of these things, he can't stand imperfection what we might call perhaps in in church circles, sin. He can't be in the presence of sin because sin is completely contradictory to everything that God is. The Bible tells us in Genesis that that God created man and he put something of himself into man. He said, let's create man in in our own image. And he gave us free will. And uh, I, I always question whether that was a really great idea, God, to give people free will. But God wanted someone and he wanted a people that would love him and choose to love him. And so because we have free will, we have that choice whether we want to love God or whether we want to just go our own way because we feel that perhaps we know best. And a totally just and righteous God cannot allow sin to go unpunished. If you, if you take all those descriptions that I gave of him early on, God cannot allow sin to go unpunished because if he did, he wouldn't be God anymore. He wouldn't be all of those things. But thankfully, God is also full of mercy. And the Bible tells us that, that actually God is love. So 
we hear some of the characteristics of God that, you know, he's merciful or he's gracious. But actually it says God is love. And because he is love, he, he's got this desire to see man reconciled to him. So on the one hand, he knows that sin has to be punished. But on the other side, he's desperate for that relationship to be restored. And you know, there is a risk in today's world that we can become sort of polarized, I suppose, in our, in our view of God. There, there will be some people who see God as being uh, an angry punishing, vengeful being who just wants to wipe people out. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, we will have people who say, well, God is love. Um, but you see, you can't have one or the other. God is just. He is righteous. But he also is love. And some people might say, well, how can a loving God punish sin? How can he destroy and punish people as a result of sin. But if he doesn't, he isn't God. But he still has this desire, this longing to show mercy and to have us reconciled to him. And in Jesus, we see this, this need for justice that God has and the mercy in one place. God himself becoming man and living without sin and dying in order to bring us back to God and bring us back into that relationship. So God demands justice, but he loves mercy. And that's the background we have to bear in mind when we come then to look at these two verses, and these two verses in the Beatitudes. And um, the word Beatitudes, is re I think, is really good because it, it's one of those words that does what it says on the tin. Because when you look through the Beatitudes... Jesus is talking there about the attitudes that we should have, the attitudes that we should display. Uh, and actually, he doesn't want us just to know. He doesn't want us just to understand or maybe even just believe what those things say. He wants us to be them. He wants us to be the attitudes that he is actually speaking about. And so we come to verse 6. Blessed or happy or complete or satisfied are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And it's an interesting use of, of a phrase, isn't it? Hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I suppose if we think of our, our physical beings, you know, we, we, we have hunger and thirst because we need food and we need water. They are the most sort of basic things to, in order to keep us alive. Uh, and so a hunger and thirst for them are, are, are really powerful drivers for life. And I think what Jesus is trying to say here is, I need you to hunger and thirst for righteousness as well, for this right relationship with God. Because actually that is what is vital and fundamental to us as human beings. We're designed to be in this relationship with God. And Jesus says, hunger and thirst to put that relationship right, to get back to what it is that God set out to do in the beginning. And as we look through this hunger and thirst for righteousness, I think there are three elements to it that are worth just exploring. And the first one is actually about that wholeness, that completeness of our relationship with God. It has to be the most basic thing in our lives. Without that, we are incomplete. It's not possible for us to be in relationship with God unless we accept Jesus as our Savior, unless we take that gift of mercy. And in the moment that we receive God by faith and we say, thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us, well, I, I, I recognize that, that you've died to take away my sin, then we are reconciled with God. That, that relationship is restored and God is able to, to commune with us again because he, he sees us through Jesus. So we're justified by that, by that faith. But I don't think that's where righteousness stops. <laughs> because the day we accept Jesus as our Savior, we're reconciled to God. But, but there's a, a need for us to continue that journey, to, to continue in, in that journey of becoming more like Jesus, of becoming closer to God in that relationship, to try and, uh, and make that relationship more complete on a daily basis. The second thing is that the outworking of that 
righteousness, the outworking of that acceptance ourselves of what God has done for us, should then also flow over into then a desire to see others accepting Jesus as their saviour as well and having that right relationship. You know, we've already seen in, in what I've described that God cannot allow sin to go unpunished. And so the implication is if you don't have Jesus in your life, if you don't have that relationship, then punishment is going to come. And that's quite a tough thing to talk about. And back in the old days, um, we used to have what, what people might call fire and brimstone uh, sermons where people would be shouting, you're going to hell unless you accept Jesus as your saviour. And uh, I, I suppose it, it's quite a hardcore thing to do. Um, and in today's society of you know, marketing and things, it might not be the way that, that people might suggest that we go about things these days. You know, there might be some more positive things about the gospel that, that we could sell. You know, the relationship with God, the joy that we get inside, the, the fellowship that we have with, with other believers. But it actually doesn't stop the fact that people are going to hell. And some people in church, you know, don't actually believe that hell exists. Might even be people here tonight who don't think that hell exists. You know, they believe that a loving God could not punish men and women for their sin and can't put them into eternal destruction because he is a God of love. But when I read the Bible, that's not what the Bible says. And actually Jesus himself, further on in Matthew, uh, talks about what will happen. So in Matthew 25 and, and beginning at verses 31, it says this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed of my father, take your inheritance the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And these words are also echoed then in Revelation. In Revelation 20, it says, Then I saw a great white, can't say that, great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the death and Hades gave up dead, the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they'd done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. People, we have to grasp the urgency of what the gospel says and what Jesus says. People are going to hell if they don't know about Jesus and they don't accept him as their saviour. And you know, sometimes we can, become, uh, we can become immune almost to the, the horrible reality that, that every day that the people that we're passing walking in the street, 
the people that are sat next to us at work, the members of our families who maybe don't know the Lord yet, they're damned. And sometimes we just don't get it. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's a serious thing. I, I, I sometimes wonder, you know, if, if, if everybody who didn't know Jesus as their saviour wore one of these as they were walking down the street, perhaps that might wake us up a bit, you know? You walk down the street and you see people like this. I don't know, what's it going to take? What's it going to take for us to wake up? Because I don't know about you, but I want people to be able to take that off. And thirdly, if we really are hungering and thirsting after righteousness, it also means being passionate about addressing the injustices in our world. The hungry, the homeless, the poor, the sick, the persecuted, the oppressed. I think it's really interesting when we look at that passage in, in Matthew where Jesus was talking there about those who, will, who will, will be with him in heaven. It doesn't say it's the ones who went to church the most. It doesn't say it's the one that were the most holy or the ones that preached the best sermons or led the best worship or made the best tea behind the coffee bar. It says it was the ones who fed the hungry, the ones that gave drink to the thirsty, the ones that invited strangers in, the ones that gave clothes to those who needed them and visited the sick and those in prison. You see, the righteousness that God is seeking from us isn't just about our personal salvation and our personal relationship with him. It isn't just about the desire and the need to tell others. It's actually also the social gospel of caring for people in our community. And actually, by doing that, we then get the opportunity to talk to them about Jesus. Sometimes we need to deal with people's physical needs before we can deal with their spiritual ones. And I guess that's where mercy comes in. Verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. You know, sometimes we think of justice, and maybe we think of justice in, in quite a, a selfish way. Um, you know, our interpretation of what we think justice is. So, We've been wronged and therefore we want justice. You know, we want that right to be wronged. And yet, when we read in, in the book of James 2, it says, For the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as the person who's broken all of the laws. So, you know, we may not have any murderers amongst us tonight. I hope not. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you've ever lied, if you've ever stolen anything, if you've ever disrespected your mother and father, then we've broken the law just as much as a murderer has and we still deserve the punishment of death. But if we've already seen God in his great mercy has poured out his love upon us and he's taken all of those things, all the rubbish in our lives and through Jesus has wiped them away. And you know, when we recognize that, when we understand that, there's a responsibility on us then for us to show mercy to others because we don't deserve God's mercy but we need to reflect that to other people as well. If we want to receive mercy from God we need to show mercy on a daily basis to others. So what does mercy look like on a daily basis? Well, by its very meaning it means giving people not what their actions deserve. Mercy isn't something you do for people you like. You know, if, if, you, if you love someone and someone's nice to you and you do nice things to them, that's not mercy. And being mercy, merciful isn't easy. You know, actually, it's downright hard sometimes. And the people that we need to show mercy to are often the ones that really wind you up. They're the ones that maybe seem to be going out of their way to hurt you. The ones that are awkward, the ones that are difficult. The ones sometimes who find themselves in situations because of choices that they've made. But when you think about it, that's exactly what God has done for us. He's shown mercy to, the, to those who don't deserve it. 
While I was preparing for tonight, I found a, an article, and I'm going to read it to you in a second, and I think it, it just helps to put in, in context what mercy should look like on a daily basis. It says, Having lived intentionally as a Christian for more than 40 years, I've avoided the easily labelled sins, acts that would require my arrest or resignation, and yet I'm a persistent sinner. As I move through this day, how will I live mercifully? What words and actions will express mercy to others around me? In a given day, I do ordinary things and I transverse a fairly unexciting landscape. My mercy will not show up in grand gestures. And most of the time, mercy re reveals itself only in fleeting moments. For example, mercy gives you his seat on the bus acting as if he was about to get up anyway, rather than making you feel he's doing you a favour. Mercy doesn't let out that sigh, you know the one, the, wor the wordless disapproval towards the person in the checkout queue ahead of you, whose card doesn't swipe, or who can't find his coupons, or whose toddler's having a meltdown. Mercy offers quiet sympathy and doesn't convey with body language that this hold-up is ruining their day. Sometimes mercy chooses not to send back the food that isn't that great because actually the waitress looks really overwhelmed. When mercy's been wronged, the offended one doesn't make it difficult for the offender to apologize or ask forgiveness. In fact, mercy does not wait for the other's action but forgives so quickly that the person needing forgiveness is freer to ask for it. Likewise, at, at work, at home, or in the classroom, mercy creates an atmosphere in which a person feels safe to admit they've made a mistake and ask a question. And if mercy must correct someone, it pains her to do it. And she does it gently without vindictive relish. Mercy makes a habit of giving others the benefit of the doubt. Mercy's not in the habit of sending deadly glares at people who are annoying. Mercy gives charitably, knowing eventually to take advantage of them. Mercy welcomes you, fully aware that this act may disrupt their whole plans for the day. Mercy relinquishes control when doing so allows another person to grow and learn, perhaps at her expense. Mercy makes it his business to help others succeed. Mercy clears the way for others so that they can walk on an even path, no matter how halting their steps or injured their souls. In all these situations, mercy treats power as a sacred trust. I can be merciful because I have some power in that moment, the means to affect another's life. I can act mercifully when I use my power to do kindness to others who haven't earned it. I was at a conference recently and it was, in t in it was interesting to observe how the well-known powerful people wore their power, how they responded to others' admiration, how they spoke to those who weren't so well-known or admired. Some used their power to make room for others and invite their voices. Others used their power to dominate the space and the conversation. In my own work, I've achieved a certain level of expertise and others' respect. When I sit in a room with colleagues, they feel the weight of my opinions. With a sentence or a glance, I can crush or I can encourage. I can open up the conversation or I can shut it down. Most of my sins involve a failure of mercy. Whether through unhelpful opinion of someone, my silent sentences that criticize them, my words or thoughts about others in the privacy of my car, my neglect to help or my refusal to notice when help is needed. Each failure denies a bit of healing that might have happened. And both the non-recipient and I are worse off because of it. Thus mercy has become my new sin detector, a personal barometer. Am I showing mercy makes for a self-assessment that's simple, direct, and difficult to misinterpret. I found that very interesting but quite challenging and just to, to check, you know, uh, uh, we were talking to someone earlier on and, and it's very rarely that, you know, we go and rob a bank or uh, you know, do something like that but actually if I can contemplate on my own daily life, 
Sometimes I'm ashamed of the things that go through my mind and the lack of mercy. This week I was um, prayer walking. We, we, we have a rotor where someone walks the, uh, and prays on the street in the village every, every day of the month. And uh, I have to admit, I, I missed one of mine earlier on in the month. I'd forgotten about it. Um, and so I wasn't supposed to be on Sandwich Road on Thursday evening, but I ended up being there. And uh, as I was walking down the road, I encountered a, a young guy who's probably in his early 20s. Um, his name was Craig. And uh, as, as he was walking towards me, I just sort of smiled. And uh, he said, will I get arrested if I walk on the sandwich bypass? Which I thought was quite an unusual way to start a conversation. And uh, I said to him, well, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but I said, uh, to be honest, I wouldn't recommend it because it's quite a busy road. And uh, from what I can uh, tell from the weather, I think it's about to sling it down any minute. So I, I wouldn't do that if I were you. So I said, you know, where, where are you going? Do you need a lift somewhere? And uh, he said, oh, no, I'm, I was just heading over that way because I know there's a, there's a sort of a bridge over the road and I've got nowhere to stay tonight. So I was just going to go and sleep under the bridge. So, <laughs> so I thought, okay, I wasn't expecting this conversation. And uh, this, this must have been about quarter past six, I suppose, in the evening. And I'd got quite an important meeting I needed to be at seven o'clock. Uh, and it was one of those moments where you think, do I, do I get involved in this? Do I keep going? Uh, and, and I said to him, so Craig, have you, have, you, uh, have you had anything to eat? And he said, no. So I said, look, why don't I take you to McDonald's and we'll buy you something to eat and we'll see if we can find somewhere for you to, to stay. And uh, he, he said, oh, no, 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 I can't do it. I've, I've, you know, I've been a burden to too many people. I can't do that. And I said, J just come with me. Let's go and get McDonald's and we'll see if we can find sort something out. So he did. He came with me and we got chatting. And I found out a bit more about him. And he was originally from Deal. I think ended up in foster care somewhere in Dover. We didn't get into all the nitty-gritty of it, but somewhere along the line, I think he's, he's probably made some bad choices in terms of friends, made some bad decisions. Um, who knows what may have happened to him in the past. And uh, anyway, we were, we were chatting away, and, and I was trying to find s somewhere where we might be able to, to sort of help. And uh, it was getting now to about 20 to 7. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, I've got to get to this meeting. Um, so anyway, I said to him, look, I, I've got to go to a meeting, Craig, now, but I want you to swap numbers with me, and as soon as my meeting's over, I will contact you again, and we'll see if we can find somewhere for you to stay. And in the meantime, Noel had, had helped me to, uh, with some suggestions. So went to the meeting, came back, and uh, picked him up on Sandwich Road again, and by this time, someone had offered him somewhere to stay for the night, so I took him to where he, w he was going to stay, over in Clarendon. And um, I'd said to him, look, Craig, I think, I think it'd be really good to try and going up to Emmaus up on the Folkestone Road there because they help people who are homeless. They give people some work to do, and in, in, in exchange for that, they, they give you somewhere to, to live. And it, you know, it might give you something just to sort of get your teeth into. So he said, yeah, okay, I'll try that. So I left him, and I said, look, text me tomorrow, Craig, because let me know how you get on. I've been interested to know how you get on. And I said, if you don't text me, I'll text you. So he said, yeah, no, no, no I'll, I'll text you. The following day came, no answer whatsoever. Um, I texted him, said, don't forget to let me know. Text him at the end of the day, how'd you get on, any news? Still nothing. Text him again the following day, uh, still no response. But I did in that conversation, and, and he'd mentioned things about, you know, why was I doing what I was doing and, and helping him. And in one of the text messages, I just said to him, look, Craig, I, I think you just need to know Jesus. You, you need to know Jesus in your life. Um, and he still never replied. <laughs> and and it, on one part of me, I'm thinking, oh, you know, I'm really, really sort of sorry about that. But I don't know what more I could, I could have done, to be honest. And who knows what will actually happen from that, whether somewhere down the line he will, he will respond. But God, you know, is causing us and wanting us to have some of those encounters with people. You know, um, Sally earlier on talked about praying for opportunities. I prayed that I'd have an opportunity to speak to someone this week. I had no idea it was going to be when I was prayer walking on Sandwich Road in the evening. 
and Nath, you know, a fantastic example earlier on of how we can impact other people's lives and, and just be what these Beatitudes are saying, just showing compassion and love and mercy for people and the opportunity just to, to impact people's lives. You know, mercy isn't to be saved for the rare opportunities when someone's wronged you or when you have the opportunity for, to forgive someone or release them from guilt, although it can be that. Mercy is a lifestyle, a way of bringing that sort of healing balm into people's lives. Those that we encounter on a daily basis, it's living in a way that actually reflects the mercy that we've received from God. And so what should our response to these verses be? Well, as I said earlier on, the, the first thing is, if we don't know God as our Savior, we don't have that right relationship with God, then that's got to be the first step. Another little article that I, that I spotted while I was preparing it says this, it was at the cross where God's justice was perfectly administered and his eternal mercy publicly displayed when God took upon himself the punishment meant for the guilty. The perfect, sinless, infinitely just God devised the only means by which sinful, guilty human beings could be justly reconciled without an ounce of guilt being swept under the carpet. No other proposed means of liberation for humanity even begins to address this dilemma. And the writer of the book of Hebrews asks a question that every man and woman needs to comprehend. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Unfortunately, some stumble over the gospel of Jesus even while incessantly seeking either justice or mercy in matters that they deem themselves entitled to judge. When our justice is threatened, we rarely hesitate to demand answers whether the object of that justice is a mere child or a perfect God. This is nowhere more evident than in attacks on the character of God based on his administration of justice, particularly in the Old Testament. But at the root of this reaction lies the failure to appreciate the full implications of what one really asks when one demands justice. If justice is to be absolutely served, the guilty cannot go unpunished. The only recourse for the guilty is to seek mercy, and mercy can't be demanded. It's a gift of God. And if you don't know Jesus today, you can accept that gift from God and know that right oneness with God. And we really need to grasp the urgency of the gospel and the need to share the truth of the gospel and the truth of who Jesus is with those who are going to hell. Who are you going to reach out to this week? Today, tomorrow? Who needs to know that God loves them and wants to have a relationship with them? And we need to hunger and thirst to address the needs of the oppressed and those in our community and the wider world who, who need to know the love of God in a practical way. You know, how are we fulfilling those things that, that Jesus listed in Matthew 25? And finally, we need to live mercifully, showing love and compassion to those who are perhaps not deserving of it, but are in desperate need of it. And by living that way, we're reflecting what God has done for us. Seek justice and love mercy. I'm going to ask Rich in a second if he'll just uh, play a song for us. It's a song by uh, a band called Casting Crowns. It's called Jesus, Friend of Sinners. And it probably sums up in about four and a half minutes what I've taken probably 40 to say. Um, but just as we play this song, just allow it to sort of settle in you. Allow it to challenge you about the way that we're living and the way we're living out what God is calling us to do. We're not going to have an, you know, an emotional appeal or anything like that, but if, if anything that I've, that I've spoken about tonight has, has really just struck a chord or you, know, you want to talk about anything, KT, Marcus, I will we'll be around at, at the end. Just come. If you want us to pray for you, we'll pray for you. But let's just grasp. Let's just grasp the, the, the fullness of what is in these two verses. To seek justice in all its facets and to love mercy and to live our lives in a way that reflects the mercy that we've received from God.